I year 10, lesson 4 of Adaptations in UK Systems. I hope you've got your notepad and pen ready. Um, you definitely will need another colour and uh, you will also need to be able to switch back to show the homework for an attachment for one of the activities. So our lesson today is how do polar bears survive? So this lesson is all about adaptations. Um, adaptations, we'll look at what that actually means in a minute. And uh, there's also two other keywords, extremophile and feature. So what is an adaptation? So an adaptation is basically a feature or characteristic that helps an organism to live uh, as beneficially or as efficiently as it possibly can in its habitat, so their natural environment. So they will have changed over time to adapt to that particular environment, um, which is why we have so much variation in our sort of different species of plants and animals in our world. So there's three different types of adaptations. Luckily for you, you only really need to know about one of them. It might be useful to know about the other two as well. So the structural, behavioural and functional adaptation. So behavioural adaptations are things that the animal or plant will do in order to actually help itself survive. So for example, birds will migrate somewhere warmer in the winter or there are certain animals uh, like bears that hibernate in the winter to make sure they don't suffer in the cold weather. Um, and also reptiles bask in the sun to warm up that cold blood so that they can make sure their body is able to do all the processes it needs to do at the right temperature. So those are things that the animal or plant does itself uh, by choosing to do it. Functional adaptations are ones that they probably do without knowing and it's more about how the body works. So for example, how the animal will reproduce or metabolize. So there are some species out there that if they were to have um, a, you know, a mate with another um, member of their species, they, if the mother or the female isn't ready to be pregnant, they can actually delay or prevent the um, fertilised egg from implanting until the mother is actually ready. So for example, it might be that they're not uh, able to be pregnant because they haven't got enough food store or um, they haven't uh, quite become mature enough yet. So they will delay the implantation of the embryo so that the mother can actually make sure it's in the best sort of situation to make that baby uh, be able to develop properly. Also, this is pretty cool. Um, in some uh, animals, they've got a special sort of antifreeze, which is sort of similar to what we put in our um, windscreen washer stuff uh, in the winter to make sure that it doesn't freeze. Uh, at really cold temperatures in our car. So um, in animals that are in particularly cold environments, they have a sort of antifreeze chemical that they will release uh, to make sure that their metabolism, the rate at which they do chemical reactions in their body, maintains uh, so that they don't end up literally sort of freezing to death, really. That's pretty cool. So these are the ones you need to know about, mainly structural adaptations. And luckily, they are the more obvious ones. So if you think about the adaptations of an animal or a plant, we're talking, we normally think about the size or the shape or the colour of the organism, or sometimes we're just talking about part of the organism. So, for example, the biggest one that nearly always comes up is camouflage. Most animals are really well camouflaged for their environment, so that they can either be really smart predators, or as prey, they can get away from their predators. Another really big one is about reducing water loss. You obviously don't want to lose any water if you're in a really hot area, so you want to keep hold of it. So there's lots of different adaptations that animals and plants have in order to make sure they keep all the water uh, they need in their body. So, your challenge. There's not a lot from me today, which you might be quite glad about. Um, <laughs> But your challenge is, if you go back on to show my homework, you'll probably find an attached document. I've done it as a PDF and as a Word document, so you can use it how you like. Um, and it's called Adaptation Statements. And there are lots of different statements about how an organism could be adapted for its environment. But what I wanted to do is try and do a matching exercise. So uh, on the next slide, there are five different organisms. Uh, and I've given you the sort of environment they live in as well. And I want you to work out which statement goes with which organism. So there's more than one statement for each organism, and some of them are the same for different organisms. So uh, you'll see replications or duplicates. So the way I suggest you lay this out is if you do it kind of like a mind map. So if you put the name of the organism, so for example, one of them is a polar bear, 
uh, if you write the word polar bear in the middle of your page or somewhere, and then around it, you can write all the different statements that you think link with it. And if you want to challenge yourself a little bit further, see if you can actually explain how the adaptation that I've given you or the feature actually helps the organism to survive. So, for example, why does a polar bear have white fur? Can you expand on that and actually give me a reason? So your five different organisms are these. You've got a polar bear, which obviously lives in the Arctic, which is very cold. You've got a camel that lives in the desert, which is very hot and dry. Kangaroo rat, which is also in the desert, which is hot and dry. Don't be fooled by the size of the picture, they are very small. Um, you've got a barracuda, which is an aquatic organism, also lives in the water. And you've got a cactus, so a plant there that also lives in the desert. So pause the video, have a look at those statements, see if you can work out which statements go with which animal and what plant as the cactus. Right, so grab yourself a different pen, preferably green if you've got one, and we're going to add our, well, add extra detail if you can, um, but make sure we've got them all right in the first place. So let's start with the polar bear. So they live in extremely cold climates, which is normally quite um, icy or snowy, so it will normally be white kind of um, environment around them. They also do spend quite a lot of time in the water as well, uh, getting to different areas of the uh, ice shelf so they can actually find more food. So hopefully you've got they have small ears and these are actually to help reduce heat loss. So they want to keep themselves nice and warm. If they've got really big ears, then lots of heat can be lost to them. So they have these small ears that are lined with fur to try and stop the heat being lost from them so they can stay warm. So their fur is really thick, it's very dense. Um, and it's also got a thick layer of body fat underneath it to insulate it uh, from the cold. Their white fur acts as a camouflage. Now, some of you maybe have uh, done a bit of pub quizzing, I suppose, during the uh, quarantine time. And a lot of you will probably have found that polar bear's hair is actually transparent. But for the purposes of GCSE science, uh, they want you to say it's white fur. And this is uh, camouflage not only from other polar bears, because they're quite uh, solitary animals, but it's also from uh, their prey that they want to be able to creep up on. They've got really large feet. Um, so these actually have two really useful ad um, sort of adaptations. This adaptation has two really useful uses. Um, the first off, it, can sp it spreads the body weight of the uh, polar bear across quite a large area so that it doesn't sink into the snow. So it can walk with um, less effort. But secondly, it spends quite a lot of time in the water uh, finding prey. And it, they're really good little paddles, so they can actually swim really effectively. They're quite big polar bears, so it takes quite a lot of effort to move their body through the water. So the big paws help with that. There's a few more. They have brown irises. So the coloured bit in your eye is called your iris. And they have brown ones, and this actually helps with um, the sunlight that is reflected off of the snow. So not only do they have to deal with bright sunlight anyway, being in the Arctic, um, but it's also reflected off the snow. So it's very, very, very glaring and very bright. So uh, these brown irises help the polar bear be able to see really clearly. They also have grease over their fur. So if you think about how if you put oil in water, it separates that. And that's because oil and water repel each other, they don't like each other. And um, by having grease on their fur, it means that when they then come out of the water after they've gone for a swim, the water literally drips off. Um, if it stayed on the polar bear's hair uh, and its fur, then it would freeze and it would actually keep the bear really cold. So it's important that the bear is dry as quickly as possible. So greasy fur pushes the water off, it repels the water and keeps the bear nice and dry so it doesn't get cold. Underneath all of that fur, um, the polar bear skin is actually a black colour, and this is uh, a link to physics. And we talk about uh, different surfaces and how well they absorb or reflect heat. And black is actually really good at absorbing any heat. So if any heat waves get through that hair, it's then able to be absorbed really quickly and effectively into the skin. And lastly, it's a quite a big surface there, um, sorry, big volume compared to the surface area of the uh, polar bear. And all of that is to try and reduce heat loss. So um, for surface area to volume ratio is something that comes up a lot. And um, we're going to be talking about 
uh, lots of links and that in loads of different topics in biology, chemistry and physics. So if it's something you're not confident with, um, definitely go and have a look on the BBC bite size links about surface area and vo uh, for volume ratios. If you've got a very small surface area and a big body, um, then you're going to reduce your heat loss. So that's what the polar bear has. So hopefully you've got all of those. Let's have a look at the camel. So this is kind of like the complete opposite of the polar bear. You've got a camel which lives uh, in the desert area. Um, I should have a little bit at the top there of that PowerPoint slide. I don't know where that's gone from you. So he has a brown coat for camouflage. So obviously being in a sandy area, it would prefer to be brown rather than white so it doesn't stick out. Uh, a lot of people think that there's water stored in the hump of the camel. It's not it's actually fat. Um, but what's pretty cool about this is that the fat can then be turned into uh, water by the camel as and when uh, it's required. So if it's very dehydrated, it can convert that fat into water. Very, very little fat elsewhere on the body, and that's to stop the camel from being insulated. So it can lose heat really quickly, so it prevents overheating by not having fat anywhere else in the body. It doesn't do many wheeze, and it doesn't sweat a lot. So it maintains its water levels quite well. So it doesn't, um, any water it does take in or any water it does convert uh, from the fat that it's got stored, it maintains within its body so that it's able to use it in all of the chemical processes that our body needs it for. Those long, thin legs opposite to the polar bear means that the surface area is really big compared to a very small volume. So if you think about all of those blood vessels that have to go all the way down those long legs and then back up, all of the heat in that blood can be released uh, into the environment through radiation, so it will increase heat loss and keep the camel nice and cool. And finally, similarly to the polar bear, interestingly, um, it's also got wide feet, the camel, um, in uh, comparison to the size of its legs. So it, this is also to help it, um, like the polar bear, to spread its body weight over the sand, uh, in this case, not snow, um, and therefore it won't sink into the sand. So it, it, it can walk really kind of effectively and um, with little effort over the sand. If it had really small hoofs, um, then it would uh, sink into the sand and it would be really difficult for the camel to be able to move, especially as, as we, I don't know if you guys have been to the beach lately, um, but the sand moves around and around your feet a lot, which makes it quite difficult to walk on. So if we zoom in on the camel's face a little bit more, uh, they can actually close their nostrils. So if there's a big sandstorm that occurs, the nostrils close and stop sand from getting in and irritating the lungs of the camel. And similarly with the ears, um, these don't close, but they're lined with fur and it stops the sand and dust from getting in as well. So um, hairy ears on the inside. The long eyelashes as well, they're there to protect the sand from falling into the eyes and any dust that gets brought, um, brought along with those sandstorms. Um, and also what's really useful is that a camel can pretty much eat anything. It's got a really, really tough tongue. Um, so it can eat things like thorns from cactus. Um, and it does eat bones and things from um, animals that maybe have died in the, uh, in the desert. So it will pretty much eat anything. So it's able to get as much nutrients as, as, it needed, as needed. So cactus, this also lives where the camel lives. Um, and so it's going to need to reduce water loss. So it does that by having this waxy layer. So as we talked about with the polar bear, that waxy um, or greasy layer helps reduce, uh, it repels water. So having that waxy layer on the outside of the cactus means that um, nothing is going to be lost from the inside of the cactus. But the cactus is able to get water into itself really effectively in a different way, which we'll talk about in a minute. It doesn't really have leaves. I don't know if you've ever really looked at a cactus, but they don't have any leaves. And um, they have spines, which not only stop predators from eating it, other than camel, because they've got these tough tongues, but they also, not, leaves are one of the ways that plants lose water. So if you have really sp small spines instead of leaves, then no, the very little water will be lost. And it stores water in a fleshy stem. And I read somewhere, or I think I watched it on Netflix somewhere, um, that a, a, a cactus can actually swell 80% bigger, or it's able to make, uh, it's, it's, it can get really huge uh, from the amount of water that it absorbs inside itself um, 
once it gets water in through the roots. So it's got a fleshy stem, the waxy layer stops the water from being lost, as well as having no leaves, so it, it swells up really, really big and it stores it for a really long time. Um, similar to the uh, polar bear, it's got quite a small surface area to volume ratio, and this is nothing to do with heat loss, it's more to do with water loss. So it's not going to want to have lots of, um, sort of space or pores that water can be released from, so it, it keeps its body nice and big, but very small surface area. So this is how it gets, it gets its water. They have really sort of shallow, so they don't go very deep into the ground, but roots that go really, really spread out, so they'll spread really far and wide around the cactus, so that if, if and when it does rain, the cactus is able to absorb much of that rainwater as possible. Um, but then there's a few cactuses that will have uh, one or two really, really deep roots um, that will go really far down and find under that water that is stored under the ground. So that's really rare in the desert and um, will only be very specific species of cactus. So kangaroo rat also lives in the desert. Um, he's brown, just like the uh, cactus, so he's got that camouflage, and he tends to only go out at night when it's much cooler, so he avoids that direct sunlight um, and is nocturnal. Most of its water comes actually from seeds, so it doesn't need to find fresh water or sources anywhere. It will eat the seeds, and the seeds will provide him with as much water as he needs. Um, a lot of our water also comes from our food rather than beverages that we drink. Similar to the uh, camel, it doesn't sweat, um, doesn't much, I don't think it urinates much either, um, and it doesn't pant, so things like a dog will do uh, the panting, which helps it to, uh, to actually it's more to do with heat um, loss there, but it will also be with water loss, um, but it, it does everything it can to reduce water loss. Now these large back feet are really important for the kangaroo rat, because not only does it help with its name, but it helps it hop away from its predators and it's amazingly able to hop up to two meters at a time and if you a kangaroo rat is about the same size as a hamster so for two meters for a uh, sort of hamster sized mammal is quite quite a big jump and um, so they're really important uh, for keeping it safe and lastly that long tail when it's hopping it's really important to make sure that it's able to balance itself so it doesn't fall over, obviously, um, and so it can effectively get away from its predators. And lastly, we've got the barracuda, the fish who lives in the water. So it's got a streamlined shape, so that when it swims, it's able to get through the water really quickly because it's got very little friction. If it was uh, a fat fish or very broad, it would obviously need an awful lot of more power to be able to get through the water with the water resistance uh, that it provides. The silver colouring of the fish allows it to be camouflaged, so um, it can actually creep up on its prey. This is a predator fish. Um, it's the fish that actually kills all of the eggs that would be in the finding Nemo, I believe. Um, it's obviously very, very different to land-based animals because it's got gills, so um, it's able to extract oxygen from the water um, and then sort of breathe by using that not any land-based animals have that. So those are, I'll just pop back there, those are some sort of the, I wouldn't say most common animals, but they are and plant, but it's, they're ones that you can use the example of the adaptations and you should be able to apply them to any other kind of organism that they um, give you in an exam question. So for example, if they would give you another aquatic uh, organism, you can sort of start thinking, oh, well, it's going to have gills, does it need to camouflage to be able to be a predator or prey? Um, and obviously, be stealthy and ca um, catch its prey or hide from its predator. You can also talk about the streamlined shape. That's not just unique to the barracuda. You also need to start being able to link things like whether surface area to volume ratio is going to be big or small based on whether it's cold or warm climate. You need to think about the length of the hair, the different colours hair, the camouflage. All those sorts of things you should be able to link based on what organism they give you. They are not just going to give you a camel or a polar bear, although that would be very nice if they did, wouldn't it? So there's some particular organisms that are exceptional um, at being able to live in really kind of what we call extreme environments. 
And these are known as extremophiles or extremophiles, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Now, if you think about how this word gets broken down, you've got extreme or extreme at the beginning. So that means obviously something quite big or quite kind of, <laughs> uh, what's the word I'm trying to look for? Quite sort of insane, maybe. Um, and then file means like in Latin. So if you're a phobe, you don't like. If it's a file, then you do like. So it's something that likes to live in extreme circumstances. So, for example, on our, on our planet, we've got really high temperatures, high pressures, really alkaline or acidic conditions, or very particular, particularly salty conditions. So these organisms that live in these really extreme high temperatures or extremely cold temperatures, these will be known as extreme worlds. We don't tend to see them very often because of, we don't really go into these kind of environments very much. But the ones that you might sort of be asked about are things like bacteria. So if you go really deep down into the de uh, deep sea, you will, there are vents where the um, water gets heated up by underwater volcanoes and things like that. And there are very there is very little life there. However, that things like bacteria they live in these deep sea vents because they have been so well adapted to live in these extreme conditions such as the really high temperature, the really high pressure that involves with being so deep down and really close to these underwater volcanoes. So, the, I mean, it's incredible that they're able to do that anyway, but the reason why they do it is because it's very nutrient rich uh, down there, but also there's very little competition. So they've been able to kind of take over and dominate in that area and um, be really successful at living in that very particular niche of um, the, the planet. So really quite, I think it's quite a nice, simple multiple choice question for you. Pause the video, have a look through, um, but the polar bear has thick white fur and what's it for? So why is it white and why is it thick? Look at the two options um, of, on each one and then make your decision. So the answer is A. Uh, it's got white fur, so it's camouflaged for being able to hunt its prey, so it can creep up on things like seals. And it's also thick, so it actually traps in the air and keeps the polar bear nice and warm. If you didn't get that right, feel free to go back through the video or go and have a look on the BBC Bite Size link, which I've popped on uh, the Show My Homework entry before you have a go at this written task or the quiz, uh, just to make sure you do as well as you possibly can. So this is the main writing phase. I know you've done probably quite a bit of writing already with the um, adaptation uh, mind maps you've done for the five different organisms, but I'll try and make this as easy as possible for you. So for grades one to two, tell me the physical or structural adaptations that enable the polar bear to survive. So you can use what you've done already to um, help yourself with that. So you can just write polar bear adaptations and then you can list them. But if you want to push on to grades three and four, or three to four, sorry, and then I'd add on to each of those adaptations how each one of them helps the polar bear survive. So for example, you would write, um, the polar bear has white fur for grades one to two, but for grades three to four, you'd add on to that by saying, the polar bear has white fur for camouflage, for hunting its prey. But obviously I'm expecting about three or four different adaptations for you, and each of those to be explained for grades three to four as well. For grades five to six, um, you need to describe and give reasons for the huge range of adaptations among plants and animals. So obviously think about there's lots of different um, environments and types of environments that we have on our planet. Um, you also need to think, uh, I would try grouping common adaptations that help or enable uh, organisms to survive in each different type of uh, environment. So for example, think about what the kangaroo rat and the camel have in common in order to be able to live in a dry, hot desert. And then for grade seven to nine, why are there extremophiles? So think about where they are, why they are there, and um, why they might want to stay there. So pause the video, have a go. So let's go through these. Uh, make sure you've got a different colour pen so you can correct it and add extra detail, always useful. So for grades one to two, any of these um, I would be happy with. So you could say you've got white fur, thick fur, the layer of fat, uh, large paws or feet and small ears. If you went said anything like the brown irises or the black 
um, black skin, any of those are fine as well. These are just probably the five most obvious ones. And then if you push on grade three to four, um, you should have been adding on the bits that are in metallics. So white fur for camouflage, and you can add on for creeping up on prey. Uh, thick fur for trapping air for insulation or for keeping him warm. Uh, the layer of fat is also for insulation or for keeping him warm. Don't mind, but try and use some more scientific terminology if you can. So improve your work if you want to. Uh, the large paws or feet prevent sinking in snow and for paddling in water. And the small ears to reduce heat loss. For grades five to six, there's quite a bit here. This is quite probably the chunkiest bit of writing if uh, you went to town on it a bit like I did. So we've obviously got lots of different uh, living environments on our planet, so they have to have a huge range of adaptations in order to be able to meet those different um, requirements of living in different environments. So uh, animals and plants that live in hot, dry climates, they'll tend to have uh, adaptations that help it not lose any water and actually get it to lose heat. So for example, the kangaroo, rat and camel uh, have got a few in common there, so they don't, don't do many wheeze. They've got large self serotonin volume ratios. You've also got the cactus that you've thrown there too, saying about how it's got um, spikes really into leaves, and so it's got lots of water staying in its fleshy stem rather than being lost to the um, leaves. However, alternatively, you've got the animals and plants that live in colder climates, such as the Arctic. They wouldn't need those because they'd need the opposite. Um, so if, I don't mind if you obviously talked about the polar bear there and then said the kangaroo, rat, and the camel are different. As long as you've got the idea that obviously they need to have different adaptations to suit the environment they live in. And then you can also talk about a completely different type of organism, the aquatic organisms such as the barracuda. They need completely different adaptations in order to be able to live under the water instead of on land, such as the gills. Okay, so seven to nine, um, the extremophiles bit. So they're really effective at living in really extreme conditions, and that's example seriously hot or very very high pressures and this is so that they are able to thrive in these unique conditions um, where nothing else is really going to compete with it um, and then they can dominate that, that in that environment or that habitat so decide where you got up to uh, today I achieved so did you get up to describe explain you or combine and then tell me what you were able to do using your words in the white box Pause the video if you need a bit of time to write that down. Um, not only this week have I got the show my homework quiz, which you must do so that we can see how you're getting on. Um, I've also, at the end of this video, got uh, two past paper questions that I thought we might like to have a go at with mark scheme. I've both done it so that it's one exam question and mark scheme, one exam question and a mark scheme. Um, and I'm not going to talk you through it, but you might just want to have a go at it, get some exposure to exam questions, which is one of the it's a feedback you guys gave the science department so um i'll you can i'm not going to talk you through it but you can pause the video have a go and um, mark, mark it yourself see you next lesson